All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to another episode of the Remarkable Coach podcast. As ever, I'm your host, Michael Pacheco. And today, joining me, I have Chris Iskander. Uh, Chris is a seasoned technology professional with over 13 years of experience at a rapid growth tech startup, which grew into a world leading organization and provided a successful exit for himself and the other shareholders. Chris is also a skilled executive and team coach whose clients have included leaders and high potentials at Fortune 500 companies, uh, founders, and C-suite execs uh, in the startup space as well. Chris, welcome to The Remarkable Coach. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining me, man. I appreciate you making the time. Um, as always, to kind of kick off this podcast, I'd like to invite my guest to just tell us a little bit more about yourself in your own words and why it is you do what you do. Sure. Uh, let's see. I am 47 years old. Uh, live in Toronto, Canada, born and raised in the area. Uh, studied mechanical engineering in undergrad, uh, did a master's degree in robotics and control systems, and then spent most of my career at a tech startup founded by some friends of mine from university. Uh, when we started out, we were maybe a dozen of us or so. We were in our late 20s. Um, didn't really know what we were doing, but we were too stubborn to fail. And so <laughs> it was more or less complete chaos. But through brute force and uh, some ingenuity and some luck, we made a go of it. Uh, company grew organically over the first few years, up to about 65 employees. Uh, and then we acquired a couple of competitors and kind of tripled in size overnight and had to figure out how to make sense out of all that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when we sold the company in mid-2018, we were just north of 300 employees. Uh, so that was a nice exit for myself and the other shareholders and gave me a chance to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up mm -hmm. and uh, how I came into the whole world of coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of goes back to, I'd say my early twenties. And prior to that point in life, I'd been very, very much a cerebral analytical conceptual kind of engineer type thinker. Mm -hmm. And looking back on myself, then I can, I can see that I was living more or less entirely in my head. Mm -hmm. But if you had told me that at the time, I would have looked at you funny. I wouldn't have known what you were talking about. I would have been like, of course I'm in my head. Where where else would I be? What are you even talking about? Uh, so I was very kind of one dimensional in terms of my access to the human experience. It was all thoughts and concepts. Um, and I didn't really have, uh, I didn't know what I was missing either. Like I didn't have the experience of just ever really being present in the moment um, or really connecting with people deeply or even understanding or noticing the nuances of interpersonal dynamics um, or even what was going on within myself. I would say my self-awareness at that time was, was quite low. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, I would have been very, would have been, I was quite arrogant and condescending towards anything that would have, uh, that I would have at the time written off as like soft skills or fluffy, fuzzy stuff, right? Like that's artsy fartsy nonsense. I'm an engineer, give me the hard science. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was kind of my world back then. And on the advice of a, a friend of mine, I took this weekend long professional, no personal development kind of workshop. Mm -hmm. And it really opened my eyes and kind of shined a bright light on my blind spots and kind of handed my ass to me in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really got to see what I've been missing and how arrogant I had been and how a lot of the things kind of capital T truth were really just beliefs, assumptions, judgments, all just stuff I'd accumulated along the way and never really questioned. And I got, I had the felt experience of, of noticing that and becoming aware of it and seeing how the power of, of actually reframing and choosing consciously how I, how I choose to see myself, others in the world. And it was so, it was a powerful experience. It changed me and it changed uh, how I, like my relationships, my sense of myself, what was possible for me. And it, it because of how much I was impacted by that experience, I, I really, from that moment, had dreamed of one day being able to make a career out of helping others have the same sorts of insights and realizations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I that that planted the seed 20 something years ago, 25 years ago, probably. Now, there was never a straight line between tech startup and, and anything like that. And we were working insane hours and there just wasn't much time to really 
do anything about it. So I, that hit the back burner uh, for a long time. But then when the company sold, suddenly I had some time on my hands. I had some financial flexibility and it was a perfect opportunity. So I, I went all in on, on this, did a bunch of formal coach training and it's been my primary obsession ever since. I love it, man. That's a great, what an origin story. Um, I think, you know, in, in, in my experience, I've talked to probably hundreds of coaches over the years and one of the qualities that I think makes a great coach is having a diverse breadth of experience. And it sounds like you've been, you, right? Because you, you, you've kind of been on, on one side and, and then you're, you know, you went through this eye-opening experience and, um, yeah, I mean, tell me, tell me about like, what was, what was it, what was it specifically that you went through that kind of made you see that there was more to life than, you know, left brain engineering, mathematics, uh, logic, right? You know, what, what opened your, your mind and your heart to, um, to this, you know, the idea of soft skills, let's put it that way. I'm trying to think yeah. about ways to, to, phrase, to frame and phrase this, and it's kind of a bit difficult, but I think you know what I'm getting at. I do, uh, and it, it's going back a long way, so I'm trying to remember if there was a specific experience or moment that really did it for me, but... What if I frame it this way? Do you... Do you, do you work with people who remind you of yourself back then? And if, and if you do, how do you help them? Yeah, uh, all the time, all yeah. the time. I think because of my, my background as an engineer and, you know, in the tech world, a lot of my clients are also in the tech space. And um, I kind of focus on that realm because there's a lot of shared experience and, and shared ways of thinking. Engineers are trained to think a particular way and a, as a field of study, it tends to attract people who are already predisposed to think in that way. Uh, so there's the the type of thinker um, aspect of things. And then there's also just the lived experience. Like we can speak the same language. Um, you know, if someone is a product manager or a product owner or an engineering manager, like I've been in several of those roles and worked with all of the other ones. And so we don't have to waste any time laying groundwork. They can talk about how uh, you know, they're struggling with their scrum master and they're on a two week sprint and they're implementing agile. And like, I know what all these things mean. And so we speak the same language, which mm -hmm. helps kind of fast forward. The We just kind of drop in and can get right to work is sure. one of the benefits there. Sure. Um, in terms of working with people to broaden their own awareness, uh, there's really no, no one size fits all to that. Mm -hmm. Um for me, the access was, it started off kind of philosophical and abstract, um, and then went from there through like a, a chain of reasoning to get to, oh, here's why, you, here's why you've been wrong about the things you're so certain of. Uh, and it was kind of, I was led there philosophically. So what was so powerful about that was in this particular course I took kind of met me where I was at. It started off in my head and then led me from there to someplace else mm -hmm. um, by deconstructing a lot of the the rigid notions and and beliefs that I had and getting to oh like if I let that go then what's left mm -hmm. and what's left is 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 not a thought it's an experience of something much more spacious like oh wow I can actually I can actually shut this down for a minute and fully experience what's going on with me or between me and the person I'm interacting with mm -hmm. nice in, in terms of your your clients are you working primarily only in the the tech space i know you, you in your your bio it mentioned you've worked with leaders and in, in high potentials at fortune 500 companies founders and c-suite execs in the startup space is this all primarily within tech or or are you do you do more uh it's not exclusively tech i've worked with um you know clients in well, i was going to say the banking sector but banking is mostly tech uh, anyway <laughs> <laughs> and so in tech. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. There, a lot of them are in in some flavor of tech, whether it's you know sales in the technology space, or whether they're engineering managers or product managers, mm -hmm. or uh, you know VPs or or more senior. 
Mm -hmm. So it, it, there's just sort of a, I think a natural fit. Um, I'm not opposed to working with people beyond like in, in other domains, but where I seem to have found my niche is, is primarily in the tech space. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it sort of runs the gamut from the larger companies that would work with people more in the middle management range, anything from manager up to director or VP, let's say. And then if it's a smaller company, small to mid-sized startup, then I like to work with the leadership team, founders. And, and uh, there's something that's uniquely special about that particular niche, because if I can work directly with the senior leadership team, it really magnifies the impact. Mm -hmm. uh, like as impactful as it is to coach one leader in an organization, if I can get a whole team together and give them a common language, a common vocabulary, set of frameworks, uh, exercises to do together, you mm -hmm. know, then you can really create a, a super high performance team, which is deeply rewarding and, and can make a huge difference to the health and success of an organization. Yeah, I love it, man. Um, at, at, at Boxer, we, we, we say our, our kind of internal slogan is that we help the helpers. And it sounds like you've got a, a similar kind of, similar kind of mindset. Um, so it, one of the kind of phrases that we like to joke about on, on this podcast specifically is that every, every executive coach's dirty little secret is that they're a life coach. Cause you're, cause you're dealing with people, right? Yeah. Don't, don't tell anybody. <laughs> uh, do you find that true? Are you, are you, you know, what kind of things coach is such a, a broad term. It can mean, you know, two dozen, three dozen different things. Are you working, you know, when you're working with leaders, are you working more on personal stuff? Are you, are you looking at like ops? Uh, what, what kind of, you know, tactically speaking, what kind of coaching are you doing? Yeah, it's a great question. <clears throat> so the, the, content that comes up, um, there's some variability. Like sometimes it's pretty tactical. There's a particular situation that someone wants to think through and they're not sure how to handle it. Uh, but invariably the tactical stuff is linked to something that I would call developmental, where there's like a new capacity or a new skill set or uh, a new way of being that the person ultimately wants to cultivate. Or they've reached a point where they're realizing that what got me here won't get me there. You know, like all of their habits, all of their, the things that have driven them to a certain point are no longer sufficient to get them to the next level of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, one really common way that that shows up is uh, people that are super highly accomplished, successful, and they, they rocket all the way up the hierarchy to say director or VP. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of high achievers are, get there by being driven by this really harsh inner critic. Right. Like if they fail, they just beat themselves up mercilessly. And, and that's kind of the by cracking the whip on themselves, it, it, it has always kept them moving forward and has helped them achieve success. But internally, they're brutal to themselves. And then when they reach that senior level where they're about to enter the C-suite or the executive level, they're told, oh, you've got to work on your confidence and your executive presence, which is exactly the opposite of this inner critic right? It's like quieting that down. And so the struggle is how do I put down this, this sidekick I've had that's been my, has helped me get here. And now I have to kind of end that internal relationship and somehow transcend that and, and get into like this mindful state of inner calm where I'm grounded in knowing that I'm okay. Mm -hmm. And that, that can be a, it's a super common thing that happens all the time. Imposter syndrome, people sometimes call it. Yep. Oh. Um, so that's a pretty common one. Uh, and then perhaps more broadly than that, I think if there's a through line that kind of unites most of the work I do, I'd say it comes down to two things. One is, is clarity of thought, which is kind of untangling assumptions, beliefs, conflicting motives that are not really explicitly clarified yet. So kind of getting all that out in the open and untangling it. Yeah. Uh, and then the other piece, which is, just as big, maybe bigger, is clear, effective communication. Mm -hmm. uh, so much of what we do comes down to communicating, mm -hmm. uh, especially in leadership. In leadership, it's more or less all you do. There's yeah. some decision-making, but even that's collaborative for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's generally speaking quite a large chasm between what people think they're conveying and what they're actually conveying. You know, what like in the intention of the sender and what the receiver actually takes away are often very different. And there's a lot of 
really good work that can be done helping people tighten that up and just get mm-hmm. better at communicating. Mm-hmm. So that's that's my one of my favorite places to play, and uh, it shows up quite a bit. I like it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I couldn't agree more. I think in you know, whenever you're working with teams, um, and and leadership, you know, anything uh, in that realm or in that zone, the interpersonal is it drives everything. Like it's yeah. it's the it's the lead domino, right? Totally. Um, that, that you know whether it's you know communications or and and I think self awareness is a big part of that as well, right? Understanding yourself and understanding how you communicate will help you better understand or have empathy to how you are then perceived by others, right? For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you know, within communication, there's are you speaking clearly? Are you setting clear expectations? Are you holding people accountable? Are you, you know, or are you beating around the bush and kind of watering down the message and trying to hint at something indirectly without saying it, which a lot of people do under the guise of being nice. But it's 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 not nice to make someone guess what you really want. It's actually frustrating. Yeah. So uh, helping people communicate directly, but in a way that's effective. And so that that sort of requires separating the content of the message from the the vibe or the energy or the the charge around it okay right yeah. and 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 so that's that's kind of where inner world meets outer world managing your own stuff and your own emotions having mastery over your own emotional state so that when you communicate when if you can master your inner state you can say anything to anybody and they'll be able to hear it mm-hmm. that's my conviction uh mm-hmm. and where we struggle is when when what we're trying to say gets contaminated with how we're saying it Mm-hmm. which is really a reflection of some unresolved emotional stuff that we've got going on. Yep. Yeah. And it shows up as a judgment or uh, as snark or yeah. cynicism or, you know, something like that. Sarcasm. Yeah. yeah. I, I know, um, you know, when I get into those situations, I'll, I'll, I'll take a beat and I'll make sure that I'm not breathing shallow. I'll, I'll check my pulse and see if my heart yeah. is racing and then maybe, yeah, just, just take a beat pump the brakes a little bit and, and, come, mm-hmm. you know, find a way to come back to it or to just approach it in general, um, from a more grounded place. Totally. Yeah. 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 And there's, there's the stuff you do in the moment when you notice you're starting to ratchet up, uh-huh. like you said, take a few deep breaths, kind of step back. Uh, there's some physiological like you're engaging your parasympathetic nervous system and kind of cooling your engines yep. a bit. Then there's some bigger picture stuff, like just keeping in mind, like recognizing that for what it is. It's a threat response. Mm-hmm. When we get sort of amped up, it's part of our brain responsible for keeping us alive. doesn't know the difference between a bear coming at us from the woods mm-hmm. and somebody criticizing our PowerPoint presentation. Right. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, these are not That's the same me. things vastly different things <laughs> <laughs> exactly and so having that awareness top of mind which is like fundamentally in almost every situation you're probably perfectly safe your physical needs are met your survival is not threatened and whatever the worst case scenario possibly is of this thing that's freaking you out in the moment at the end of it you're going to go home to your perfectly climate controlled home <laughs> that has food in the fridge Mm-hmm. And, you know, you've got Netflix and Disney Plus and Crave and you can you can go on Amazon and click on something and have anything you can imagine wanting tomorrow. Like it's yeah. things are fine. Things yeah. are fine. And, and, and but, you'll 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 get there vis-a-vis your perfectly climate controlled automobile. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. With the seat warmers, if it's winter and, uh-huh. you know, it's, it's just uh our actual lifestyles have improved so much and evolution is painfully slow. Mm-hmm. So, but, but we can hack that by being aware of it and just really keeping that top of mind, realizing you're not threatened and no. it's, and whatever, even if someone's coming at you with, with harsh criticism, more often than not, that's not about you. Like if they're losing their emotional control, that's, that's them losing their stuff, right? That that's, that's about them more than it is you. Um, 
and just kind of letting other people's stuff be theirs and taking full ownership of yours mm -hmm. uh, can be tremendously liberating. And then there's other practices too. Like I'm a huge fan of, of meditation mm -hmm. uh, sure. on the regular, which is a great way to establish a, a stable, calm baseline, regular mm -hmm. exercise. Um, yeah, lots of great stuff people can do to really get to a place of mastery over their inner state, which I think is really the keys to the kingdom. Yeah, even like, man, it's just simple stuff like being able to mentally delineate between who you are and what you do. So if someone is, mm. you know, like I said, if you're giving a presentation and someone's criticizing your PowerPoint presentation, that is not an attack on you or your person, right? Yeah. It's, 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 it's a criticism. It's an attack, right, on your presentation, on something that you, that you did. And it, it doesn't, it's not don't let that affect, you know, it's not, they're not attacking you and who you are. Totally. Yeah. There's like, we tend to conflate our identity with yeah, there you go. what we do or what, or a thing we did or the way someone reacts to a, a piece of work we put out or whatever. And, and the two are, are not the same. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. What, uh, Chris, what does a typical engagement with you look like? Uh, typical engagement would be, Six month engagement is fairly common. Um, it really depends on the scope and the goals. Uh, so, and we start with that. What does the client want to achieve? And people usually have a vague, some of a sense of what they want to work on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we start by, by really getting that crystal clear and defining like what would a successful end state look like? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we fast forward six months, how will we know that we've succeeded and that our time together was valuable? Mm -hmm. And I look at that from at least a couple of different angles. Like what are the measurable things? Maybe somebody wants a promotion or a raise, or they want to take their business to, you know, X level of revenue or profit. So those things are measurable. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them are quantifiable. Others might just be behavioral. Like I will have a new habit that's fully ingrained mm -hmm. or people will be giving me feedback that they've noticed a change in this way or that way. Um, and then there's the interstate, like how will you feel differently and how will you think differently? And, and you know, so we kind of look at it from the objective and subjective points of view until they've got a really clear picture of the destination that we're aiming for. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I do a couple of other things at the outset. So, you know, we get a clear picture of where we're headed. And then we also need a picture of where we're starting mm -hmm. so that we can carve out a map between points A and B. Mm -hmm. So the destination point B, the next question is, okay, well, what's point A? What's the current reality? Mm -hmm. And a person will have their own sense of what that is. You know, they can lay it out. Here's where I think I am. Here's where I think my challenges and struggles are uh, based on their own self-awareness and self-concept. But I like to supplement that with sources of data from two other places. One is um, a standard personality profile okay. that gives some objective data we can kind of map onto a person's sense of themselves. Which and then one the other you? is my, um, I'm a bit of a contrarian when it comes to assessments. There's a million popular ones out there, yep. uh, you know, DISC and Myers-Briggs and all of those. And the, the truth about many of those is that they're pseudoscience mm -hmm. and being an engineer, I just can't, I can't stomach it. So <laughs> I default to what's actually scientifically validated and by far and away the most scientifically validated uh, model of personality is called the big five mm -hmm. uh, model of personality traits. So it, it, rather than putting people into types like, you know, ENFP or INTJ, uh, it, it rates you on a percentile basis on five different axes, openness to new experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So um, I use a test called the IPIP 300, which is a 300 question survey based on that. Mm -hmm. And it, it gives you you know, a percentile rating on each of those five dimensions. And then within each of those five, there are sub dimensions, which get more granular and nuanced. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my approach with assessments. Nice. And then my favorite tool by far is uh, 360 feedback. Yeah. So I'll have the client identify usually between say six and 10 people in their orbit who are in a good position to provide feedback about them. And then I will uh, conduct those verbally. So we'll mm -hmm. do like 20 minute zoom calls typically mm -hmm. where I ask them, you know, what would you say this person's top strengths are? 
top weaknesses or blind spots and you know what other advice might you have and uh, that's where I, I get really great uh, feedback from a variety of other perspectives and then with all of that in hand we've got the person's sense of themselves we've got this personality assessment and we've got feedback from others now we've got a clear picture of point a we've got a clear picture of point b and then we dive in and go to work and so typically we'll meet uh, either weekly or bi-weekly for about an hour uh, through the span of the engagement. And then we check in periodically every four to six weeks or so. We check in and say, okay, are we on track? How are we doing against your goals? Are those still the goals? Has anything changed? What corrections do we need to make along the way? And kind of rinse, repeat until uh, until they reach their goals. And, you know, it it happens somewhat frequently that we'll start off on a six month engagement and, you know, by the end of month three or four, they've gotten everything they wanted and we end up having a, an early completion conversation and kind of virtual high five and off we go. <laughs> awesome. 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 Um, that sounds like, so that's the, it sounds like one-on-one -on -one coaching. Is it, is it a similar process for, for team coaching when you work with teams? Team coaching is quite different, actually. Yeah. So yeah, you're right uh, to point out the distinction. One-on-one um, -on -one coaching is kind of highly personalized and is, you know, very much a, you know, this active inquiry exploration where it's the thought partnership kind of thing. We explore together and see what unfolds in the conversation and, and insights emerge. Team coaching is a combination of some of that, but there's also uh, more of a training and educational component to it. Mm -hmm. So. You, know, you get a team together and talk to them about creating a team charter, for example, where you ask some very concrete questions like, um, what's this team's mandate? You know, what is the shared objective or objectives that this team needs to produce that none of the individuals could do on their own? What is it you need each other for? Gotcha. And, you know, who are the stakeholders? What would they say your objective is? Mm -hmm. You know, and so you kind of work backwards from the stakeholder perspective get clear on what the mandate is what are the roles you know who's in what role what are the boundaries between your different roles is everybody aligned about that mm -hmm. what are your team values you know what do you really stand for and not in like a schmaltzy kind of <laughs> motivational poster kind of way but like what do you actually value sure. um and how i measure that is like your values as indicated by your behavior right like what are you actually doing because that'll tell you what you value that's yeah. I mean that that's that was going to be a follow up question. Is how do you? I mean, how? Do, sometimes when you ask someone a direct question, you're going to get fed a line of BS, or maybe it's not intentional BS, right? Maybe they just don't. Maybe they don't have the self awareness to to really know. How It'll do give you give me something aspirational, right? Like this is yeah. what I there you go. sounds good or what I think we should value. Yeah. And then so that always I always come at that with some skepticism and kind of cross check it against, you know, how do you, what do you reward? What yeah. do you incentivize? What do you disincentivize? That'll tell you what you're actually valuing. You know, yeah. somebody might say we value work-life balance. Okay. But you know, you're ordering pizza for the team at 9 PM on a Friday. You can't tell me you value work-life balance and you don't have to value that. You know, you can value uh, competitiveness and hard work and grinding it out. That's perfectly I mean, in my startup experience, we categorically did not value work-life balance. <laughs> it was anything but. So I'm not here to judge what your values are, but I'm here to hold up a mirror and help you get clear on what they are so that you can tell the truth about it and just either get, get honest about it and own it. Yeah. Or if, if you discover something in that process that really doesn't work for you, then what do you need to change in terms of your behavior, what example you set as a leader, um, what you reward, what you disincentivize, what do you tolerate that you shouldn't be tolerating, uh -huh. all of those sorts of things. And when a leadership team can get crystal clear on those things, um, you know, your mandate, your mission, your stakeholders, your values, uh, and then one other thing, which is a set of what I call working agreements. Huh. Um, and by working agreements, this is all the stuff that we kind of assume and take for granted about how things should be done or how we should interact with each other, but we don't often talk about. It. Mm -hmm. And this is where a lot of friction comes up. A lot of, like if, if my assumptions about what's super obvious and yours are different, 
then we'll be butting heads about things that we each take for granted, but we never talked about. Right. So the thing to do is to, to identify those and to talk about them. Uh, a classic one would be accountability. Uh-huh. How should we hold each other accountable? Uh-huh. It's, we're going to be, over the course of our work together, we're going to be making requests and agreements, promises, and sometimes we're not going to keep those promises. Uh-huh. Right? So then what? <clears throat> you know, How should I call you out if you're late on something you promised to deliver to me? And how can I expect you to respond when I do that, right? And if you get clear on that stuff up front, then it takes away any awkwardness, any friction, and it, you're sort of preemptively disarming a lot of the sources of conflict. Mm-hmm. And so that can be super valuable. So where did we, how did we get here? You were asking about the difference between team coaching and one-on-one coaching. With team yeah. coaching, there's much more of a structure to it mm-hmm. and much more of a, an educational component and then a co-creating the answers to all of these questions that I've just been pointing to and then documenting it and saying, okay, here's who we are as a team. Here's how we want to work together. Here's whose job is what and and all of those things. Uh, And when you get a team that's aligned on on all of those um, variables, Mm -hmm. you know, it's something else firing on all cylinders and, uh, and look out, you know, they can, there's a, there's a remarkable difference between a team like that and your average team yeah uh, which is sort of chugs along at some state of mediocrity or low-level dysfunction yep that's great man i think um you know circling back to you you said i'm not here to judge your values like what you guys value right pizza at nine o'clock at night on a friday yeah i think that in in any business there are you know we, we we get fed the same like business owners leaders right we get we get fed kind of the same stuff over and over and over again right so work life balance is supposed to be valued well like you said like maybe it's maybe grinding it out right maybe it's maybe maybe pizza and beers on, at 9 p.m. on friday is is team camaraderie right maybe yeah. that's the values There's nothing wrong with that and I think that it's, this is one of the reasons, so I was having this conversation with one of my coaches earlier this morning. <laughs> and I, I think it's very difficult for leaders, business owners, founders, whatever it is, to see that sometimes because they're so in the weeds. And that is why it is so, so, so important to have a coach because you need mm. someone, you need someone who is detached from the situation, yeah. right? You need to have someone around that you can go and say, what's, what am I missing? What am I missing? Because I'm in the eye of the hurricane, right? Totally. You're, you're totally. outside. You can see what's going on help me. <laughs> what yeah. am I missing here? Right. And I was having that conversation with my coach this morning about some stuff that's happening at boxer. And I'm just, and I'm like, I feel like I'm missing something here, but I'm just not sure what it what it is. Like you you see the bigger picture. Like help me out. And it was a, it was a really great conversation. I think that's one of the like just one of the huge values of having a coach, is being able to come in and and do things like that. And again, like you said, like to not judge, but to be able to kind of give you the truth. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, I've heard it called the clarity of distance. Uh huh. There you go. Um, and I like to say uh, it's really hard to read the label from inside the bottle. Mm-hmm. And so totally. that one too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's, that's just kind of how we're wired. It's always easier for us to see other people's blind spots than it is our own yeah. and vice versa. And I think that's a huge part of it. And then the other thing you mentioned, which I think is critical is just kind of reflecting the truth, but without judgment. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, those two are, are, uh, very closely linked Mm -hmm. like that's what a coach is Mm -hmm. as distinct from say uh, a romantic partner or a business partner or whatever they're they also have your number and they can reflect back to you what you're not seeing but they're probably going to do it with a certain edge or voltage to it because they've got skin in the game right right? their own needs are tied up in it right and it, it just comes with a different energy and and there's also more at stake in that relationship if someone close to you is coming at you with that certain negativity, like it's going to trigger your own defenses because you know yeah, it, it might threaten certain aspects of your, 
you know, if it's a business partnership, it can threaten your, your, your work, your career, your finances, you know, with a romantic partner, it can threaten the stability of your home life. Like wh where your mind goes is like, Oh no, something that I really value is at risk right now. Yeah. Whereas with a coach, I don't have like my only commitment is to my client mm -hmm. and I don't have any personal charge or anger about whatever they're dealing with or doing or not doing or seeing or not seeing. And my only role is to, is to hold up a mirror yeah. for their benefit. Yeah. And, and it's, it's done you... purely for them and, and they, they get that and they know it. And so they can hear it from me in ways that uh, they can't hear it from others. Yeah. Yeah. You're able to, you're able to deliver the the bad news with with love right without 100 percent. yeah yeah and they know that i'm only doing it because i care because that's that's what this relationship is it's my job to kind of in part to help you see uncomfortable truths that you might not want to see mm -hmm. but i'm not doing it out of any malice i'm doing it because you're paying me to do it mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and you, you want it on some level or you wouldn't be we wouldn't be talking yeah i love it man um, tell us about a, a big win that you've had uh, with a, a client of yours as a coach. Yeah, uh, a recent one uh, that I'm really quite proud of. Uh, I may have alluded to it a little bit earlier in, in more general terms, but um, a client who's a, a VP, just super successful. Um, like one of these people that just, I was enormously impressed with her list of accomplishments and, and her success and her confidence. Uh, and she came to me because she was frustrated at um, her inability to get the attention and the resources and, frankly, the, the respect that she needed from her CEO and C-suite in order to really be able to do her job. Mm -hmm. She was in charge of a, a small but um, promising area of a much larger business, mm -hmm. basically like needed certain things in order to really run with it and grow and felt like she was kind of hamstrung a bit and needed some changes to be made, including like she wanted full P&L accountability and wanted her own sales team and her own marketing people and her, some of her own developers and like involved reorganizing some things in the company mm -hmm. and it just wasn't getting done. So uh, long story short, we worked together. This was one where we signed on for six months and, and within three, three and a half, she, she got everything she wanted. The, the big insight for her was uh, as as confident as she is in her abilities, when it came to negotiating and really getting what she needed and commanding that respect at the at the senior levels, she also had this desire to please and to be liked. Uh, and that was getting directly in the way. And so she was kind of letting people brush her off or not take her seriously. Non-confrontational. So, Non-confrontational, you know, very smoothing things over and, and was just not assertive enough, frankly. Um, and I, I find not to generalize too much, but I think a lot of, there's a gender dynamic at play here. Like women are generally socialized still to be much more accommodating than men. And they're not, they're not rewarded for the same traits and behaviors that men are. So this is like a double standard there and mm -hmm. it can be challenging for a lot of professional women to overcome. And, and you know, she would, I think she would agree with that part of it anyway. So we sure. worked together for a few months. Uh, long story short, by the end of it, she got everything on her wish list from her CEO, reorganized her part of the company, gave her full P&L, gave her a budget, gave her her own marketing sales dev, just was a, was a grand slam. She got everything she wanted and, uh, it was just super satisfying. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and in, in terms of, of your engagement with her, did she hire you personally as her personal coach or was, was she, were you, were you brought in by the company? Like what is, what did that look like? Yeah. Good question. Uh, in, in this case, she brought me on personally. So I worked with her directly. Cool. Um, so some of my clients, we structure it that way. In other cases, they've got a uh, corporate budget for it. So the company pays, but I work with the client. Um, this may be obvious to to your listeners, but I'll say it anyway. Regardless of who's paying, my allegiance is to the client that I'm working with. It makes no difference whether the company's paying or they are. I'm there for them. Um, but yeah, I do it both ways. I've seen both. I think they're probably equally common. Um, okay. More and more companies, I think, are are really appreciating the value of coaching and are allocating some resources to it. 
sure. either as part of a training budget or specifically for coaching. And I think that's great. Nice. And you work, it sounds like you work on Zoom. Are you working globally? Are you working in North America, specifically in Canada? Mostly in North America. I'd okay. say a majority of my clients are in the U.S. Uh, some are in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally, uh, occasionally someone in Europe. I uh, worked with one person in India, mm -hmm. uh, which was fun. Nice. Uh, I mean, it's such a globalized world. So sure. uh, yeah, it's one of, the, one of the great things about Zoom is you can connect with people from anywhere. But majority are in North America. Uh, and I would say most of them are in the States. Right on. Right on, man. What three books do you recommend all of your clients read? Hmm. Great question. Uh, I actually have a, like a recommended reading list on my website. And so if I were to pick three, it probably varies somewhat from client to client. But um, a few of my favorites are uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, hmm. which I believe is by Kahneman. Yep. Uh, great book on cognitive biases and all the predictable ways that our brains take shortcuts and get things wrong. Yep. Uh, another one of my favorites is Stumbling on Happiness, mm. which I read several years ago. And it's kind of related, but it's in particular about how the, the primary thesis of the book is that we make decisions in the present based on what we think will make our future selves happy. Mm-hmm. And then the book goes into great detail, exploring all the wild and wonderful ways we get that catastrophically wrong <laughs> <laughs> and how we, how we might go about doing better and making better choices. Uh -huh. uh, so that was a really insightful book and a fun read as well. Nice. Um, and then uh, another one that comes up fairly frequently, especially for anyone who's involved in any kind of change initiative, mm -hmm. uh, is a book called Switch by Chip and Dan Heath. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's all about change management, but it's it's presented in a very accessible, digestible way, and they break it down into a nice, uh, very clear, clean model where the takeaways are easy to remember and the insights are are actionable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's great. I think they also those guys they're they're brothers, I believe, and I think they also did yeah. made, made to stick. Yeah, they've written a, a number of books, okay. and um, I like their style. Yeah, it's yeah. simple clear useful um actionable. yeah and also actionable exactly i remember, I remember yeah. made stick being actionable like you got you didn't walk away from that with a whole bunch of theory right you you walked away from it with like here's some things that i can actually do yeah to improve yeah yeah and they, they boil things down into just a handful of, of little kind of clever one line sound bites that are easy to remember and easy to keep in mind and um you know, with a lot of their books, at least with Switch, there's like a one-page PDF cheat sheet, which once you've read the book, you can look at this one pager and go, oh yeah, here's where I need to, I need to do more of this or less of that in order to get things moving. So nice. practical, helpful, easy to read. Useful, useful reference sheets. I think uh, Crucial Conversations comes with one of those as well. That's really mm. helpful. I um, haven't read that one yet, but it's on my list. You yeah, if you're dude, if you're doing stuff with like teams and leadership, that'd be a great one yeah. for you. It's, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's solid. Yeah. Uh, Chris, you've got a complimentary leadership consultation call for our viewers and listeners. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So the way I usually start working with someone or start exploring whether or not it's a mutual fit is just uh, you can book a complimentary call, forty five minutes. We'll get to know each other. Uh, we'll talk a bit about, you know, your goals, your challenges, um, make sure any questions you have get answered. And if there's a strong fit, then we can talk about next steps. Um, and if not, my my commitment with each of those calls is that uh, you're left with something valuable that you can actually put into action in your life regardless. So it's valuable, interesting call. And if it's a strong fit in both directions, we can talk further. Awesome. And where can people go to book that call? A couple of places. You can find me on LinkedIn and there's a link right on my LinkedIn profile page to uh, book a call or on my website, uh, which is executivesoundboard.com. Uh, there's a link there, I think under contact uh, to book a consultation and you can book it right on my website. Perfect. Awesome, man. Um, is there anything else that we didn't have a chance to touch upon that you'd like to talk about? 
I mean, we could talk for hours, I'm sure, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, nothing comes to mind. This has been a lot of fun, and I appreciate you having me on. Awesome, man. I do. Before we go, I have to, uh, I have to ask. There's a, a picture of of what appears to be Tony Montana behind your right shoulder. What is, what is the significance of that? <laughs> What's the significance? Good question. Uh, that picture was actually. Uh, my brother and sister bought it for me on a trip they took to New York 25 years ago, probably. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at my movie collection, like with my actual DVD collection that tells you how old the collection is, uh, <laughs> I've got all the gangster movies, you know, all the Godfather, Goodfellas, you know, Casino, Heat, Scarface. I just, yeah. something about that genre really spoke to me when I was younger. Yeah. I don't know what that says about me and prefer not to dig too deeply into it, but it says that you're a man of taste because Pacino is a man to watch. I, right? He's he's just the best. He's brilliant. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Heat Heat is an underrated one, man. I'm glad that you brought that up. Heat is is great. Oh yeah, the the, the scene with De Niro and Pacino in the coffee shop having that just yeah amazing frank conversation is just perfection. Yeah. So so good. Awesome, Chris, man. Thank you so much for making time to chat with me about uh, coaching and everything else. Um, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You bet. And thank you, as always, to our viewers and listeners. You guys are awesome. Um, if you found this valuable, if you know someone who found this valuable, please give it a share. Uh, let people know and always, you know, do the things like subscribe and all that. Thank you so much. We'll see you guys next time. Cheers.